Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Sarah, and I'm the EDI Initiatives Associate at TCG. I'm a mixed Asian woman with shoulder-length brown hair and brown eyes. I'm here to say welcome on behalf of TCG and to go over a few quick housekeeping items. This session has captioning and ASL interpretation available, and we'll be dropping instructions for how to take advantage of those resources in the chat. If you are having Zoom trouble or have any questions, feel free to message me or just Molly privately. I also want to let everyone know that TCG is recording this session and that it ends that it's being streamed to HowlRound. I'm calling in today from the lands of the Kanarsi and Natsunipak, and I'd like to invite folks to place their own personal or organizational land acknowledgements in the chat. Land acknowledgements are important, but we must also take action in support of Native-led movements for justice. In the chat, we'll share some information about Land Back, a movement to connect, coordinate, resource, and amplify Land Back movements across Turtle Island, or what is colonially known as the United States. Please also share your own opportunities for action in the chat. It's also important to recognize and support the vibrant expanse of contemporary Native theater. And so with that in mind, I'd like to introduce Emily Price. All right, Hawe, um, Talim, thank you so much, Sarah, for that. Uh, Hawe and hello, everyone. My name is Emily Price. I'm a proud citizen of the Osage Nation. I use she, her pronouns, and I am a white skinned person with dark brown hair and brown eyes, a round face, a black shirt on, and these flower earrings that once belonged to my grandmother. Currently, I am calling in from the Upper West East Side in Manhattan, or Manahata, lands traditionally stewarded by the Wappinger, Munzee, Lenape, and Munzee Lenape people. I'm an actor, a writer, a performer, producer, and I'm learning to be more of an organizer. But uh, most of all, I am very excited to be here and about to have this conversation with this amazing group of young Native theater makers and artists. I'll let them each introduce themselves, but before we begin, I want to preface this conversation by stating that this is meant to be an open discussion between a handful of talented young Native theater makers. This is not a presentation on Native theater, nor is it a series of opinions and truths held by all Native and Indigenous folks working in this industry. I hope rather than providing certitude, this discussion can spark curiosity that will lead to further dialogue. Dialogue between staff members at your institutions, uh, dialogue between your organization and the indigenous communities on whose territory you reside and work on, as well as conversations between native creatives and your organizations. Um, I also wanna say that when we were creating this, I, I wanted to include a, a variety of, of voices because uh, we're not an um, um, amorphous people. We're not um, all one. We are made up of a variety of tribes and experiences. Um, so I just want to say, Thaline, thank you to all of you for joining and listening. Thaline, thank you uh, to Sarah for helping me organize and to TCG for, for hosting this session. And finally, Thaline, a huge thank you to these wonderful panelists for agreeing to have this conversation with me. And with that, I'd like to pass it on to Hiilani uh, to introduce herself. Mahalo, Sarah. Oh, sorry. Mahalo, Emily. I read the wrong name. <laughs> Aloha. I am Lily Hiilani Kim De La Cruz Okimura. I am Kanaka Maoli or Native Hawaiian. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And for visual description, I am a mixed indigenous and Asian woman with brown skin, brown curly hair past my shoulders and brown eyes. I am wearing a black and gray flannel and I am calling from, and I am from the island of Oahu in Kohava'i Pai Aina or the Hawaiian archipelago. I reside in Kalaipohaku or also known as St. Louis Heights 
renamed after white Americans who settled and forcibly annexed the islands into what is called now the United States of America. I am a second year graduate student at the University of Hawaii at Manoa in the MFA track for Hawaiian theater. I am also the producing director of the Late Night Theater Company of the Department of Theater and Dance at UH Manoa. I want to say mahalo to TCG, Sarah, Emily, all the panelists for this amazing opportunity and to be able to talk to you folks about indigenizing theater. Mahalo. Thank you so much. And now I'd like to invite Montana to introduce herself as well. Uh, hi. Hi, everyone. Um, hello, I am Montana Adams is my government name. <laughs> and uh, uh, my pronouns are she, her. Um, I am in Mohawk woman, indigenous woman um, with uh, light skin and brown hair that goes to my shoulders that's slightly wavy kind of uh, straight um in front i'm wearing a brown shirt and my background is the back of my kitchen um currently i am from uh not currently i've always been from aquazasne um aquazasne sits on the corners of ontario quebec and new york state um we are uh, a nation that is very divided by outside authorities uh, currently, I am a theater maker, a uh, graduate student at the University of Ottawa. Um, I've spent most of my theater career uh, in Ottawa, and I'm currently back home due to um, just wanting to be home, wanting to be near my um, homelands. Uh, and then the pandemic kept me here. <laughs> so um, I just want to say Nyangoa for inviting me over here. And really excited to start talking. <laughs> yes, thank you. And I'd like to ask Emery to introduce himself as well. Uh, hello, my name is Emery Barrera. I am a student at Central New Mexico Community College. My pronouns are he, him. I am a light-skinned Native American with long brown hair and black eyes. I am currently wearing a um, white shirt with uh, a floral pattern on it. Um, I am a proud uh, member of the Klamath tribe, and I am also based in the Lakota people. I am currently calling in from uh, Rio Rancho, New Mexico, which is on uh, Santa Ana Pueblo lands. Um, I want to say thank you to TCG for allowing me to be with all these other incredible panelists um, and just raising our voices up. Yeah. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, I'd like to ask Jamie, Jamie Lynn, to um, introduce herself. Sengi Tamu Unbiagiendi Nawehea Kunda. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jamie Lynn Ebelacker. Uh, I am from Santa Clara Pueblo. My pronouns are she and her. For visual, I am a light brown skinned woman wearing a white striped shirt and a maroon undershirt. Uh, I am coming to you live today uh, from my ancestral homelands, my grandparents' kitchen, uh, Tewa lands here up in northern New Mexico. Uh, I am an independent producer. I work a lot with indigenous uh, organizations as well as BIPOC organizations uh, on various arts productions and I'm honored to be here today. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So just so everyone knows we're going to jump into some discussion questions. We'll um, speak to them and then if there's time at the end we can answer questions from the audience as well. Um, but to start us off I want to name some guiding questions. So in general um, I, as a theater maker and uh, consumer, am excited about what the future of Native theater looks like. What does the future um, of Native activists and artists, maybe artivists, um, in theater look like? And what could it be, or, or how do we envision it? And what does theater need to be? What is crucial uh, for us and our communities and our needs? 
So the first question I want to start off with is uh, what does it mean to decolonize the theater space, theater as a whole, or the theater process? Um, I'll let that kind of ruminate if anyone has uh, an answer there or a thought they want to give. It's, is there is there a way to define decolonization? Is there a way that this could be displaced by another concept such as indigenization? Um, yeah, I don't James. know if I need to raise my hand or not. <laughs> yeah, no, just jump right in. Uh, great, great question. Um, I work a lot with um, various organizations and then with different theaters and um, uh, what what I am most proud of is being able to um, work with an institution that is you know predominantly non-indigenous and um, express needs of the community and I think it starts there with a conversation um, because there is you know so much learning to do and so much growth to do in so many different theaters and so many different organizations uh, to me decolonizing looks like um, indigenous people being able to be involved in the process from day one, from, from planning to building out a project, um, you really have to have that, that input, um, that support and, and that, that education, that knowledge base along the way, um, I, which I think is, is very often lost in, in theater companies is that, you know, that is not the case. Yeah, absolutely, Hilani. I want to echo that and I wanted to share. Um, so my Kumu, my teacher for the Hawaiian theater program that I'm in, she's the program that I'm in was like established in 2015, but she's been doing the work at my university since like the 90s, like making Hawaiian language theater productions for our community. And I think we're and we're trying to make this program strong and make it be the forefront of our university. So I wanted to echo that and say, yes, putting in indigenous theater, putting in indigenous voices. I think that's an important process for decolonizing theater and indigenizing theater. I think when we say indigenizing theater, I think that could be part of decolonization. Although I will say that there are indigenous cultures that were colonized, but I mean, non-Indigenous cultures that were colonized as well. But I also think it's important for the place that you're in because a lot of places don't heavily focus on Indigenous theater until now, thanks to us, thanks to our teachers, thanks to our like community leaders. So putting in that work is very important. Absolutely, yeah, you bring up an amazing point. Oh yeah, Montana, would you like to add something? Um, yeah, like all that, yes. Um, and also, one of the things that I find like through productions that I've been involved in, uh, working with other Indigenous people, and also working with people who are non-Indigenous, um, there's something very at the baseline of like the kind of values that they place upon putting on shows is that a lot of it is really profit driven. And a lot of it is um, uh, there's not enough time given for the amount of uh, conversation that needs to happen before something is put on. There's like, honestly, like the workshop um, way of doing things where you workshop things for like almost years before something is able to finally come to fruition. Um, that, that whole style is more um, relatable to kind of indigenous worldviews than say um, a production that needs to be put on in six weeks, you know, like the English theater way. Like anytime there is like a, a timeline put on these people, um, it always ends up coming out rushed because people, they wanna be A, like respectful, they wanna be respectful of everybody, but also they have to get things done. But that also, also doesn't like take in account like mental stability of like some people who do have problems you know who have who struggle with those things um and a lot of these things can just be solved by having more time in order to um 
put on these productions is what I find, you know, emit, and then and the end. <laughs> and at the end of that, you know, uh, I find that a lot of the times whenever there are productions that are like, okay, well, we'll give you two extra months. We'll give you two extra months to, you know, put on your show and we'll give you that much time. But then it's still not enough. And what happens is then the show is kind of put on to audiences who aren't in, uh, familiar with, you know, indigenous ideas. And the audience is suddenly taken aback. You know what I mean? Like they're suddenly like, oh, well, we didn't, this isn't what we expected because there wasn't enough time for us to process how to really show to an audience of non-Indigenous people. Um, like uh, the, one of the things that came to mind was um, at the NAC up in Ottawa, I, I worked there as an intern for a very brief time. And um, there is a production of the Unnatural and Accidental Woman uh, by Marie Clement, um, who was, which was directed by Muriel Miguel. And there was a lot of people who, um, I saw the process behind it. Like I saw what happened um, and how, uh, how much it, it was beneficial for the actors to kind of be able to um, have these discussions because the play is about like missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. Uh, it, I saw the process of what went behind that, but whenever it was presented, there was a lot of backlash that was, um, not necessarily understanding of the small intricate details and like almost ceremony like aspects that went behind it. So there wasn't enough discussion kind of had with the audience who was non-Indigenous. So, you know, there needs to be that amount of time for there to be like a communication in between the artist, the Indigenous artist and the non-Indigenous audience because that kind of leaves it up to like, there could be violence shed you know what I mean like there could be violent words spoken that just like <laughs> you know like it's 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 almost like uh it's almost like you're too afraid almost to mm -hmm. speak what you're really trying to say so you're kind of you kind of hold yourself back because you know that you only have a certain amount of time to say something so big that an audience just wouldn't understand you know something so big that we have as an indigenous people that we just know instinctively between each other you know like we can share that we can look at each other and we have this understanding between each other however whenever it comes to um sharing it with other audiences there needs to be more time in order to gain that uh, amount of communication yeah, you bring up some amazing points. I mean, all of you have. I think what I think about often is there's a we're we're in a place right now culturally as a society in these uh, place settler colonial places where you know we're living in this world that that has been colonized for so long and and these structures continue to exist, and now there is an economic demand for indigenous stories and performance without. Um, an understanding of what it means to to perform that in a way that is that is indi indigenous, you know what I mean? Um, that that in a way that it that fights against the colonial structures that already exist. So you bring up this very important point about um, the process and this idea of time. And so to me, the the question of decolonization is twofold. It's it's how do you dismantle those structures? How do you take away the, the economic value placed on a performance that like of outsiders watching an insider to, to get a different perspective? How do you take away the economic value placed on the time it takes to make that? How do you um, take away all of these elements but a mentor of mine named uh, Yagawi Hene Oaks, a former executive, uh, former executive director of the American Indian Community House in New York City, um, she said something once. She said, "You know, you can decolonize, but that's an act of taking away. And what you're left with is a vessel, an open vessel. And the question becomes, what do you put inside that vessel? Um, and I think that, I think that is what's being spoken about right now. I think." Um, Jamie, Jamie, you made an amazing point that 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 openness is where relationships and and community conversations should go. Where uh, Montana, as you said, like we should. Oh yeah, Emery, would you like to add a little something? 
Yeah. Um, I think one of the main things that we can do to put in there is to make sure that native storytellers as in writers, producers, directors are also highlighted because a lot of what's talked about lately is like boosting up native actors. And as a native actor, like that's great, but we also need to make sure that the people who are writing these stories are native too, that um, their stories are being told and told in truth. Because oftentimes, I mean, I'm pretty sure some of us have experienced this where you work on a project and you can tell it's written by someone who's never stepped into our skin. And it's like, this is a little weird right here. Um, so a lot of decolonization also means putting um, worth into Native stories, I think. Absolutely, absolutely. I think, yeah, um, I think that idea of of storytelling as, as not just a, a product or like a performance, but rather a long road in which there are lots of people um, giving and, and uh, being in conversation. And that at each of those steps, there needs to be a diverse group of people, um, not just indigenous and non-indigenous, but a diverse group of people who are ready to be in communion with those stories. That's personally how I feel. I, I feel like he, Lani, you, you brought up a, an amazing point of, yes, and also there are many people who have been doing this for a long time. Um, there are many uh, uh, mentors and, and there's a long history of, of incredible Native theater. And I think as the grow in demand economically for, for Indigenous storytelling and for Indigenous performance grows, we have to learn how to navigate the two directions that, that are being pulled in. One that is um, like performance or performative and one that is true um, storytelling in, in the way that it's a communal, it's a communal thing. Um, you, yeah. you bring up, um, you know, the economic factor a lot, the money factor a lot. And I know that is such a big issue and I, I personally have a hard time seeing, you know, that ever being, you know, divested from the act of theater making. Unfortunately, it's such a part of the structure that is, you know, Western theater and performance um, that it's it is hard to see a world where, you know, money isn't a big factor. Um, but I also like to to look at the reverse side and say, OK, if the money isn't going away, how are we making sure that it is equitably being distributed? Um, and I, I look I look at money in projects as a form of, of reparations almost. Um, I feel like if if organizations, artists, producers, creators are all um, being upfront and transparent, having that dialogue of where the money is going and making sure that, that every indigenous creator uh, is being um, fairly paid for their time and their skills and their expertise. Um, that is one way to sort of reconcile with that, with that big factor. Yeah, absolutely. Um... And yeah, um, I feel like it is it is kind of the easier road to point out all these issues and say it's the economics of it. But you're absolutely right. There's there's no way I can walk in this world and say, you know, I'm not gonna engage in that because it's true, it's a system. And, and I think you're absolutely right that it can be approached as reparation, um, that it can be approached as a, a giving a fair giving back of, of resources. I think that's, I mean, this is not necessarily related, but I think oftentimes when I see land acknowledgements from PWIs or from organizations that are not in co conversation with indigenous communities, it makes me upset because I know that there's an economic uh, thing happening behind it. You know, if, if, if money isn't if resources aren't being shared, then what's the point of those acknowledgements? Yeah, and I think this is where we as theater makers, um, young people uh, can really 
push back. I mean, in all aspects of indigenous life, we we have to push back. And this is particularly one of the areas where, um, you know, we have this wonderful collective voice of incredibly talented indigenous folks in this field. And by saying, you know, um, holding organizations accountable. And there are some really great organizations out there doing that kind of work. Um, indigenous Direction for, ones, for one is, um, is one of those organizations that is working with organizations to help hold them accountable um, so that it's not an empty land acknowledgement. There is, there is more going on um, in terms of support for native artists and native communities. And I think that that is that is a big um, that's a big uh, point here is is that we we have a lot of the power to have this conversation and not be stuck in this well this is just the way it is kind of mentality. Yeah, I kind of want to add on to the whole economic thing. You know, I think one of the big issues with a lot of mainstream and like wealth theater where the theater wealth comes from it's from audiences but um i know that especially even growing up i had some issues seeing live theater and especially live theater in the capacity that i wanted to see live theater and so i think uh, an important thing that we can do going forward is making sure that young native kids are seeing what we make and you know they're getting our they're getting our stories. They're able to see our stories. They're able to see that native people are out here making theater, because th that would have been completely life changing for me if I had seen it at like six. It would have blown my mind. <laughs> so I think that's a really important thing to make sure we continue to do going forward. I totally agree, Emery. When I was little, I I think we all grew up watching like Western theater and just Western style shows. And even though I've always wanted to be an actress and that was fun, but I never felt represented in theater and like never was there a character that looked like me that had the same experiences as me. Like, how do I fit into this world that I want to be part of? And that's why Indigenous theater and funding these uh, Indigenous theaters is so important. And I will say people want to watch it. People will watch it. You'd be surprised at how many people come to watch Indigenous theater. Like the community is waiting for it. And I can definitely speak for when we put on our second Hawaiian language show at our department, we were sold out every night, every single night. and people came twice, three times to watch the show. And of course, some people at my university thought, oh, this is surprising. How did this happen? Well, because the community wants to watch it. And clearly we can put the funds to it and we can get it back. So there's no excuses. Montana, I saw that you unmuted briefly. Did you want to add something or? Uh, yeah, I had a lot of thoughts and then she said that and I was thinking about that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I feel that. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, no, I totally agree. It's like the one thing that I get like caught up in and like, um, it's just kind of, uh, whenever we're forced to bend our stories and what we actually want to say whenever we're forced to censor ourselves. And I think that's where I come from whenever I say like the economic factor and it's profit driven, you know, because everyone's really scared to lose their sponsors or everyone's really scared to lose funding, you know? So there's a lot of, uh, it's like, it's like maybe it's getting better, but I've seen a lot of instances where people are still afraid to, you know, um, basically hire the angry Indian, <laughs> you know, like they don't want, they don't want to see that and they don't want, they're so scared to, um, you know, say what a lot of people are really thinking in communities, you know, and I think that's what I mean whenever I say like the profit driven part of it is kind of silencing the voices that don't necessarily, it, it paints this, um, this picture of indigenous people that's very pan indigenous, you know, like we're all one, we're all um, peaceful, we're all, um, you know, like, but like, I guess for the most part we are, but like, I don't know, I'm Mohawk and I know my people have done some 
messed up stuff, you know, <laughs> like, like just coming from, you know, knowing my own stuff, you know, like even those stories, like I want to be able to tell those, you know, in order to kind of have a self-reflection on what our values really come from, you know, how we've learned our values up until now. And kind of that's the kind of story that I would like to explore, you know? Um, so I think like, that's where I come from whenever I start criticizing like profit driven stuff. Um, because I've seen it happen, you know, I've seen it happen where people where indigenous people are asked to step aside because they're too outspoken, mm -hmm. you know, and yeah, I, I, I'm very careful of that. But the thing is, is that a lot of that outspokenness comes from miscommunication. So I think that's why I mean, but, but it also it all connects together, you know, everything is a circle, <laughs> you know, like, uh, uh, it, it comes from that miscommunication that happens because we don't have enough time to have these conversations. And so, I don't know, I'm just like, I am also running in circles here, but <laughs> that's kind of. Well, I feel like that's what's necessary in these kinds of conversations is to try and hold all of these things that are almost impossible to hold at the same time. Um, and yet we do. Uh, Lani, did you wanna add something? Oh, yeah. I just want to say you bring up an excellent point, Montana. And that is something that's really hard about feeling like we have or we have to censor ourselves because these theater companies or these um, producers don't want to hear our stories, even if it makes them uncomfortable. And even if it's like dark, like history. But I think that's also a very important step of decolonization is making yourself uncomfortable. We don't learn by being comfortable. And by say we, I'm like, talking to like non-Indigenous audiences. Um, I don't know why I said we, I'm Indigenous. <laughs> but um, I think non-Indigenous audiences, non-Indigenous theater um, producers, directors, you know, they, they need to be uncomfortable and they need to hear these stories. You don't learn from just being in your comfortable bubble of ignorance. And I hope that we can challenge um, these issues, you know, very soon about producing these indigenous works that talk about our truths ourselves by us because also Emery brings up um, a great point about how often indigenous theater gets told by non-indigenous people and it paints a very different picture of who we really are and our history definitely yeah yes to everything that's being said um it's 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 such a difficult question to, to live through, as I assume you all know. Um, it's one thing to discuss it, but I feel like to experience it um, is another. I want to add another question to this conversation, but again, feel free to come back to any tangents that um, you are inspired to speak to. Um, my next question is a very broad and purposefully so, and that's what is Native theater? Um, or my sub questions, should we even have to define it? Um, exactly that. Does, does that spark anybody's curiosity, mind? Um, I just think about uh, in Canada back in like, uh, whenever radio was first starting out, um, they got really scared about how Americans were going to infiltrate um, Canadian identity. So they were really quick to be like, okay, well, the amount of percentage of Canadian content has to be on radios. It cannot be American. And so they were super concerned about that. And then I think about that. I'm like, well, if mostly um, the production is, you know, Indigenous led, then it is an Indigenous production, you know, but then I'm also like, but that also kind of sounds like blood quantum and that's gross. <laughs> you know, like, I don't know. It's, that's what that's why I think I mean like if it's if it's like a collective indigenous led project like that's what I would say is an indigenous is native theater um yeah, or do you mean like uh how would you say it in like 10 words or less you know like what's the <laughs> definition if we were to look it up in a dictionary is that what yeah. you yeah I mean, yes to all of that. I, my background, sadly enough, no, I, I, I'm thankful for it, is a lot in academia, which has its own issues. And there's this whole question for myself of, do I fight and push to get more of a presence uh, of native theater in courses and syllabuses in academia? Do I push to 
to document the legacy of Native theater um, that so many people have already done, um, but continue to push for that recognition from these kind of uh, outward institutions? And if so, then do we have to define it and allow it to be dissected in a way? Or uh, on the other side of that, Part of me feels like lived experience of Native theater, the way I would define it, is relationships. Um, because I feel like, uh, opposite from my experiences in like Western theater, American theater, is that when I engage in Native theater, I meet people, and those people I continue to have relationships with again and again, stronger than perhaps in other situations. Those are some of the things that I've been ruminating on, if you will. <laughs> Sorry. So I come from a line of, a long line of um, Native artists on my Pueblo. And I used to get often asked the question, what makes Native art Native art? And uh, this is, you know, there seems to be, to me, an obvious answer. Um, but there's the there's the two options there. Is it art about native people? Is it is it productions about native cultures and indigenous indigenous stories? Or does it come from native and indigenous people and stories? And to me, I I believe it's I believe it's the latter. And while you know there is such a rich history of what is native theater. You know, um, going back to the to the 1990s at the Institute of American Indian Arts, where you know Native theater and performance art was such a big um, part of the curriculum and part of the artistry that was happening there, and you see the branches out to you know Spider Woman Theater and um, you know the Native Voices at the Autry and Two Worlds Theater in Albuquerque and these purposeful, intentional indigenous companies are creating content through an indigenous lens. Um, to me, that feels a lot like native theater and it feels like something that does need to be defined. Um, I think because we are coming from an unfortunate situation where red face in theater is still very prominent in, you know, in a lot of unfortunate arts organizations, um, I feel like they're, for now, until we're, we're able to, um, you know, find a happy place as indigenous artists, we do need to define ourselves as, as this is, this is, this was written by a native artist, this was produced by an indigenous person, these are all native actors, and I think that is, that's something that right now is, is kind of important. Absolutely. Yeah, you bring up an amazing point, which is this long legacy. Um, and I want to point back, Emery, to what you what you brought up earlier, because, you know, as a kid, I wish I would have learned more about Teata and about, um, I, I wish I had read like a Bill Yellow Robe play. I wish someone had told me about Spider Woman Theater. Um, and instead of reading the same plays over and over again you know <laughs> instead of reading Shakespeare again and instead of reading um you know this long canon of white theater um and I think that's something that that you bring up that's incredibly important that that perhaps defining ourselves is is part of that um part of creating that opportunity yeah, I'm going to say for for me, I think Native theater goes back so far to just how our ancestors told stories. You know, that to me is Native theater, and that has continued on and on and on. You know, I think about when my father would tell me stories about, you know, you know, any... um stories that he had and that came from his dad or his mom and in their parents so I think native theater is just it has always existed and it will always continue to exist and it's just that we are now just putting it on stage we are now putting ourselves and our stories and our grandparents stories on stage 
and people are ready to listen, you know? Um, and so I think it's just important to keep saying like, we are here, we have been here and people are going to listen. <laughs> Eventually they will listen <laughs> at some point. I totally agree, Emery. And in our um, Hawaiian theater program as well, we do tell the stories of our ancestors, of our kupuna, our, even our gods as well. I think like spiritual stories are also like extremely important part of native theater. Um, and then what um, Jamie said earlier about native theater that's by native people, produced by native people, with native people in it in the creative process like from the back of the house to the front of the house to the actors on stage i think that's very important when it comes to native theater um i also want to say that not just um stories from our ancestors but even like contemporary stories about relevant issues maybe about like you know climate change or um what was mentioned before the missing and murdered indigenous women children two spirit people as well i think those are also part of native theater because they happen, you know, to native people and they're relevant to our stories. Oh, and I also, I love this. I love this. Oh my God. Uh, <laughs> Uh, no, I, cause what I was, che I was cheesing about earlier was that I was thinking about like, well, I mean, like, us native people, we kind of claim things, we reclaim things. Cause the first thing that came to bed with my head was like baby Yoda. <laughs> oh my God, like baby Yoda's native. Okay, like- 100%. <laughs> that's what, yeah, that's what everyone decided, you know? Like it's, it's like a collective thing that we decide to do, you know? We decide to bring forward to our narrative, um, which kind of connects to, you know, I don't know, just like the past and the present and like what we choose to bring forward. And I don't know, it just made me so happy. I don't <laughs> um, Don't forget about Uncle Bernie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, and I was gonna say something else, but then I started laughing about Baby Yoda. So I forgot. So maybe I'll get back around to it. Yeah, no worries. What a good thing to add though, to be honest. I will say this is not part of my answering the question. But I was very nervous in um, kind of like being in this session because these are questions that are so important to me, but I'm also so scared about, you know, um, I don't know the answer is what I'm trying to say. So I'm so glad that this is happening. And I'm so glad that you brought that baby Yoda moment of levity. So thank you, Montana, for that. Um, just so we keep going along, I'm going to drop in the next question, but again, feel free to go back um, and forth. I think the whole idea of like going one, two, three and sticking to it is colonial. So um, number three, what do we as native actors and theater makers and playwrights and producers and et cetera, et cetera, need from the theater? Um, how can it be used to serve our communities? How can it be used as activism? And also, uh, what do we need from these th these uh, established theater organizations as well? Well, I think going back to um, what Montana said, but honoring our um, processes and giving time, for example, like time for you know rehearsals and debriefings and talking about these. Um, whatever that we're trying to produce on this theater, like our stories, because it's not just like a Western, like Shakespeare or Tennessee Williams stories, where it's like, here's your script, memorize your lines. This is your character biography, go. It's like the stories that we're telling are our stories. They're our ancestor story. They're our God stories. They're stories that are relevant, that are happening to our communities to these days. So it needs a longer process. So I think just honoring that these stories aren't like they're plays, but they're not plays like in the traditional sense. We're trying to set, send a message. We're trying to share a piece of our, of us. So I think, I, and I'm not sure cause I'm not, you know, um, a super producer or like 
involved in like the um, marketing side of theater, but I would love to see like honoring the these processes and respecting our stories in a different way and giving us more time and more care for us to tell them. Um, also, the thing I wanted to add to that was uh, also kind of dismantling, um, I mean, like, I guess it doesn't directly answer your question, but like, I have the thought of like, trying to dismantle those toxic traits within theater of like pitting people against one another, because all it does is create individualism and um, <laughs> we need to be a community. Everything works so much better whenever things are like, we work towards building community, especially in places, um, which is something I read in a Yvette Nolan book where she talks about uh, creating community in especially like urbanized spaces for indigenous people. Um, but I feel like there's a lot of, and I see it within my own community, and this is why I kind of bring it up, is there's this competitiveness, especially because we have so little, you know, places for Indigenous people to be um, in this, you know, this um, industry, um, where there's only a few spaces open for actors, producers, um, dramaturgs, playwrights, anything there becomes this sense of competitiveness. So it's almost like we need to constantly be creating our own safe space and building each other up as well in order to tell these stories more efficiently and more true, more to truth. There's a word that's better than that, but <laughs> I can't speak. <laughs> um, absolutely. And I, I just wanna point to this real quick. Yvette Nolan, yes, yes. I was just reading um, a piece by her called Selling Myself, The Value of an Artist, which I think is close to this conversation. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to say yeah. Um, but I absolutely agree. I think you bring up incredible points. And I'm wondering, Emery or Jamie, if you guys had anything to add. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Jamie. Are you sure? All right, thank you, sir. Um, I think that, uh, you know, seeing the behind the scenes of Native theater and productions as I do as a producer, um, what, what I identify being a need um, from theater companies and organizations and arts production companies is a commitment and a willingness to educate themselves. Uh, it is not the responsibility of native artists or producers or creators to be the person that has to fill in that um, knowledge gap for, for these companies. Um, it is, it's, it's really not fair to ask, you know, Oh, that person's native. Let's let's figure out. Um, let's you know everything. Let's ask them all the questions. It's really it's not fair position to put your native artists and creators in. Um, so I, yeah, I would say a commitment to to educate themselves and a commitment to really um, scrutinize the uh, the scaffolding around their organization that has persisted, um, you know, in its history. Uh, do, their, do their policies help or hinder um, their, you know, native artists and people that they're trying to work with? Um, does their, you know, does their financials or economic barriers keep natives from, from interacting and being part of their process? So it, it really comes down to a responsibility at an organizational level to do the work. And that's what I need. That's what we need. Yeah, I just want to note the amount of head nodding you saw on the screen. Uh, because this is such a, a crucial point that you brought up. And that um, you, as you said, you have this amazing perspective that you kind of see the other side of it as well. Um, whereas like maybe an actor just walks into the room towards the end of the process. Um, and I wanted to note this as well, that when organizations make these commitments 
and say, okay, we're going to hire BIPOC people, but the only positions that are open are at the bottom most of the organization, that that too is an issue because then what's being asked of them is to try and navigate um, an organization that has fundamentally not changed um, and yet is putting the, the burden of, of dismantling these structures on its newest uh, kind of like smallest roles, which I think is also an issue. But yes, yes, the work of decolonizing, as we've talked about it before, does not belong to the one Native person that you might have in the room, that you might decide to hire. Um, that is violent. That's an act of violence. Um, Emery, did you want to add something? Yeah, um, I did just want to add to what Montana said about um, pitting people against each other. You know, my dad works in the film industry and he has quite a few friends who have gone to direct or produce like massive things. And he often gets the question of like, well, aren't you jealous of them? And he always looks at them and he's like, no, I'm not jealous. They're out there doing the work. I'm here to support them. And it's just, it's ridiculous. And so I totally agree with what Montana said. And then in terms of your question of what do Native, what does Native theater need from more mainstream, you know, American theater? And I think it's just, it also is like that whole commitment that Jamie was saying, but it's also just actually looking for Native talent. I found that a lot of um, both in the theater and film industry. They're like, I can't find native people anywhere. And it's like, you're right there. It's like, take two more seconds to look, you know, I mean, even in New Mexico, I have trouble getting cast in anything. And it's like, I just can't find native people anywhere. Come on. Like you can do it. We're right here. It's okay. <laughs> Hi, we're here. But then that's also like, uh, it's because it's because always they, they have this very narrow and they I say like they like the man you know like they have this very narrow understanding of like what natives look like and what they should sound like and you know it's <laughs> there's not a lot of like my entire res we all have very light skin like it, there's there's not a lot of people that have like darker skin you know they don't look like the cigar store Indian you see outside of like a smoke shop or something and like <laughs> like if they get that out of their heads you know if they don't keep trying to like go by these standards of beauty that they're going by you know this like it just it's so funny because all these issues just branch out to all these other societal issues you know like we have like misogyny sexism um white supremacy and just like all these things and it's just like all they, they creep into every single orifice of like every single little industry so but like, just to point that out, like, yeah, no, they have this very narrow understanding of what being indigenous means. And I apologize if anybody is offended by my use of Indian, um, uh, just because I know some people really don't like that word. And it comes out whenever I get excited and because that's how I grew up. So, but yeah, I apologize. No worries. I, I want to note that and say I, I fully understand and it's a complex issue. I often take offense when I'm in spaces and um, I accidentally use the term Indian when people silence me because that is how the government refers to us as American Indians. It's the Bureau of Indian Affairs that we go through. So um, I acknowledge that and, and that whole messy thing. And if you don't know what we're talking about, feel free to look it up. Um, <laughs> um, and I'm sorry, I almost cut you off, Ilani. No, you're good. Um, just going off of what Montana and um, Emery said, I don't know if anyone remembers, but in 2015, there was this movie called Aloha that had Emma Stone in it. And she played the quarter Chinese, quarter Hawaiian person. And I've learned that she was also supposed to be based off of a real person as well, which makes it even more, oh my God. But, and their excuse of hiring her was we wanted someone who doesn't look like she's mixed Hawaiian and then I'm in my head thinking what does it mean to look indigenous as long as you're indigenous in here you're indigenous like and my sisters don't look like me either my older sister has like straight hair and my younger sister has white skin with green eyes and then they also had the excuse oh we couldn't find any um 
lighter skin, green eyed, Hawaiian, Asian mixed women. And then I thought, well, you filmed in Hawaii. There's plenty of them here. You had Hawaiian people as your background characters. You couldn't hire a Hawaiian actress. And there are, we all come in different shades and hair colors and eye colors. So it's just not an excuse. And also that movie just was horrible. Anyways, <laughs> um, bad reviews, um, very inaccurate. Like they were trying to say, oh, Aloha spirit, all of that nonsense. So it was very cringe, but yeah, I, that just, I, when you guys were talking about that, it made me think, oh, that movie. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Um, and I, and I think now is a good time. I have, there are a lot of uh, questions in the chat, um, which I appreciate. I'm going to point to one right now because it's very connected with what we're speaking with. Uh, someone asked, what are your thoughts on the current trend of actors and other artists self-identifying as indigenous without a clear connection to a tribal nation or community and then taking opportunities or resources meant for native people? I'm going to speak to this really quick and open it up a little more because I feel like that question as it stands, it's kind of like, that sounds like someone pretending to be native and taking opportunities. Um, but at the same time, I want to caution it because the way that people identify as native can vary a lot. And I don't think that it's an easy answer because there are certain tribal communities that are federally recognized. There are certain tribal communities that are state recognized. There are certain uh, tribal communities that are recognized by neither. There are certain tribal communities, it varies so much community by community who is enrolled officially and who's a part of the community. Um, there are a lot of colonial structures still in place, like uh, quantum and all of this. So I just wanted to open it up by first saying that, that it's not an easy question and that it's easy to, to yeah, that's just how I wanted to open it. But if anyone has any thoughts on that. The, thank you, Emily, for, for prefacing that because it is, there is no easy way to answer this, this question. Um, for those non-Indigenous folks in this session, um, the only things in the country that are quantified by blood, thoroughbred dogs, thoroughbred horses, Native Americans. So with that being said, um, it's a very tough, it's a very tough question. Um, you know, you want to sort of broach the gap between, um, you know, just someone coming out and saying, yeah, I'm native to, to fill a role, to fill a part, um, which, which has been done before. It has been documented, not just with Native Americans, but other cultures as well. Um, people feeling that they can get a step ahead by by assuming, you know, an identity. Um, and then you have the question of, well, I would rather not show my certificate degree of Indian blood to qualify for this job position or to enter this indigenous art market um, or to be heard or seen as an Indian native indigenous brown person of color. Um, so yeah, there, I, I will, you know, going back to, to what you said, Emily, I don't know that there is a, there is a good way to answer this question, but I will say that it comes back to, um, the communication and the relationships that organizations need to develop with indigenous communities and with indigenous theater makers. And, um, there are tons of resources out there. Um, like like uh, Halani and, and Montana and Emery were alluding to that that you can find these artists, these indigenous artists, if you're looking for them, and you have to, as an organization and a theater, do the work. Do the work. Don't just take Emma Stone because she's beautiful and may fit into the role. Do the work to find someone who's in Hawaiian and is just as beautiful and talented. Like there's no excuse. Um, but acknowledging it's a complicated, it's a complicated topic it really is. Yeah. Um, I have, so I am legally enrolled in the Klamath tribe, 
but my father grew up on the Lakota reservation, Rosebud reservation. And now I live in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I'm all over the place. I have grown up seeing, you know, Pueblo cultures, like Pueblo powwows, all of that. I have not been in contact with my tribe or my tribe stories unless it's through my father. So to answer this whole question of like, how does someone identify as native is so hard to answer because only recently have I been really trying to go back to what it means for my culture and what it means to be, you know, enrolled as a native American. And then what does it mean for me as just a human being to be native American? And so to answer this whole question of like, Native identity is just difficult. You know, I've I've had three Native tribes around me my whole life, and I don't even exactly know where I fit. And so that's such an interesting thing that the United States government has done because, you know, my grandfather was Lakota, my grandmother is Klamath, so they split up their kids in half. So half of my family is Lakota, the other half is Klamath we're even split up just within our family. So to then come together and just bring in culture is such an interesting conversation. And to ask of like, you know, it's all about communication and how you feel and do you connect with your culture? I think the base issue is if you connect with your culture, if you honor your culture, if you honor your, the struggle that your ancestors have gone through, you know, that kind of, in my eyes, helps me identify as Native American, of like, I can honor the stress and the horrors and the problems that all of my ancestors have gone through, both on my father's and mother's side. And that's really just what helps me solidify my Native identity. But I'm going to say, like, if you are, like, totally white, totally white, like, Irish white and you're just like I'm native now it's a little weird try not to do that please (laughs) just please (laughs) yeah Montana um okay uh there was I I'm I'm trying to remember the person who wrote the article but there was an article written uh that really talked about this in depth with acknowledging that it's like because you have people I don't know if they didn't have it in America but in Canada there was the idea of like the 60s scoop. And what that did was um, in the 1960s, they were, they basically used like a, a child and fam, not, uh, they went into homes of Native Americans, said they were unfit, scooped their kids out, and then put them in with uh, Christian barren white families. So there was a huge displacement that happened in Canada. And so whenever, there's so these people, they were then displaced into like more urban settings away from the reserve, away from, you know, their homelands. And, you know, those people, like, there's a, like, uh, it came into like another question of like people trying to attack them for claiming that they're native, when in reality, it's like, no, that shouldn't be happening. But um, recently, there was somebody who was outed as a pretendian. Um, and there was an article, a really good article. I. I don't know how to share it with everybody, but you get it's on cbc.ca or something. You can look it up in the indigenous thing, uh, indigenous section. Um, They said one of the things that I really, it really resonated with me was if you have, if you claim that you're native, you're native, like you, you have like validity, if you have a community to claim you back and that community doesn't have to be a reserve. You know, it is a community, even within an urban space, you know what I mean? And you're giving back to that community in some aspect. Like there's a equal give and take there um, between you yourself as an indigenous identifying person and the community that you identify with. You know, there has to be a relationship there, um, which is, yeah. And so that to me, I was like, oh yeah, that's it. That's it. You know, like that for me, that's it. You know, like I'm not saying like be all end all, that's it. Um, disclaimer but yeah I just want to echo that and say I was reading that article on the toilet actually uh, because that's how I read my news Um, and I had to get up and call my mother and be like uh, 
you got to read this article because I feel like, and you were talking about this earlier, Montana, I feel like there's this fear of identifying as Native when you don't check all the boxes of what people expect Natives to be. Um, or at least for me, I have a fear that I fight against, but it's a fear of performing indigeneity the right way. Um, and I think that article helped me fight that a little um, and say, no, it's not about do I walk into a room and, you know, touch the earth and, you know, do whatever. Um, no, that's not what it's about at all. So anyone who is thinking that's what it's about, that's not what it's about. Um, Keelani, I, I hope I didn't cut you off. Did you want to add something? No, you're good. I just unmuted myself. So no, you're all good. Um, uh, mahalo Montana for sharing about the scoop. I did not know anything about that. And I'm glad that we have this um, space so where you can share this information with people. That's really ugh, it's so horrible. That, like, I want to do more research about that now. But so thank you for sharing that for me. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with everything that's been said here. It's like, if you're not native, like, you're just not, why would you want to claim yourself as that? Like, what do you benefit from that? Like, what do you benefit in the long run? You're taking roles away from native people. You're claiming to be an identity that you're not and that you will never face and you will never have to experience. And just what's the purpose behind it? But I mean, if you are, if you like, if you are indigenous and you are want you want to make the effort to reconnect and reclaim that, I will say please do the effort to do that. Um, I think being indigenous is more than just like what's said on your birth certificate or what's said. It's not just like something that's on like a paper. It's who you are. It's our identity. It's what we live through every day. So I really encourage people, um, especially people who are maybe you know reclaiming this and like learning that they are indigenous, like to do the research and talk to the community members, because trust me, um, I think a lot of us would love to welcome you into our spaces and to teach you and to educate you. Um, but yeah, it's not, it's not a trend. It's not a fad. It's who we are as people. We're people. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. And um, I don't know if you've noticed, but we're pretty close to end. Um, I would love to have this conversation go on forever and ever and ever. And I also want to speak quickly and say there are so many amazing young, even if we're defining young as like under 30, native art theater artists. Um, we are but a sprinkle of them. There are so many. Um, so I wish we could have a whole conference just on that. I want to invite everyone to say a quick, like, one sentence little thing, if you'd like, to, to close us off, and then I'll uh, hand it over to Josh. I can even start us by saying, I'm so grateful for this. I've learned so much from all of you, and I, I ask that we continue to have these conversations in a, on a platform where other theater organizations can listen as well. Yeah, I can go next. Um, thank you to everyone here, especially uh, TCG and Emily for inviting me and just, it's been an incredible experience. I've really loved talking with all of you. Um, I, yeah, I just, again, want to echo Emily of like, we need to keep having these conversations with not only native artists, but artists, you know, other minority artists, you know, LGBT artists, black artists, Hispanic artists, we all need to have these conversations. So keep reaching out to those communities. Mahalo Anui, everyone, for your ike, your wisdom, and your experiences. I've learned so much today, and I've had such a wonderful time talking to each and every one of you and learning more things about the Indigenous people of Turtle Island. And I, I wish we can have more of these conversations as well. And I hope that our paths cross again in the near future, maybe collaborations. <laughs> Mahalo, mahalo Anui. Thank you um, for for the honor of, of being here to be asked to the panel. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, uh, TCG and my awesome co-panelists. 
Uh, I think it's, I, I think this kind of dialogue is so vitally important to how we're, we're helping with the education and the evolution of native theater and indigenous artists and creators um, moving forward into the future. It's so necessary. Um, thank you for including it in your, in your panel this year. Um, and to all of the uh, theater people out there on this call, um, please continue to keep doing the work and, and educating yourselves, being open and admitting that there's more to learn and being generous with each other and hydrating. Don't forget to hydrate. Thank you all. Yeah, Darlene, Darlene again. And, I'll, and with that, I will pass it right on to Josh, I believe. Can I say? Oh, Kalamai, I don't think. Oh, Montana's my God. Oh, Montana's <laughs> I'm so sorry. Oh, okay. it's okay. Don't worry about it. Well, I'm um, going to relive this all night. Okay. No, no. no. <laughs> Please don't do that. I, yeah, no, I get it. Uh, no, uh, this has been so cool. Like, uh, I, I really missed having these conversations with people like you. You guys are all so cool and you guys get it like that's so like awesome and I think like especially whenever we do connect with like other indigenous people we have that sense of like oh yay okay that connection that we immediately have it's so great oh <laughs> my heart's so full um but thank you so much for inviting me this has been awesome um and thank you so much for sharing everyone else like all your wisdom and everything um it's been great um, and I can't wait to see what you guys are doing and whatever. And I can't wait to connect again. So, and thank you everyone for listening. <laughs> Darlene, again, thank you, Montana, for um, putting up with me. <laughs> and thank you again to all of you for actually agreeing to come on to this. This was amazing. I'm going to be smiling all afternoon. And this time for real, I'm passing it on to you, Josh. Thank you so much, Emily. Really appreciate that. Um, wow, I'm just sitting with this amazing panel. Thank you all so much. Um, I just want to, you know, come on and say that I encourage everyone to keep the conversation going on Mighty Networks. Um, in the chat, uh, I've dropped a link to a feedback form where we encourage you to tell us what you thought of the session. Uh, your feedback helps TCG program our events. Uh, so please take a moment to fill this out if you can. I also wanted to do a quick plug for TCG's 60th anniversary Our Stories Gala, which is next Thursday, uh, no, sorry, next Tuesday, May 18th. Uh, so you can find out more info on that in the chat. Um, and in closing, I just wanna say one big thank you again to the panelists. Um, and I want to invite actually everyone who's on the Zoom audience right now to please come off, uh, come on, turn on your camera and microphones to show your gratitude for these amazing panelists. Thank you for your time and brilliance. Make some noise, people. Thank you. I am so amazed. Oh. Oh, phenomenal. Love it. All right, have a great night, y'all, or great day. <laughs> <laughs>